Good evening, friends at home, wherever you find yourself. We are so glad that you have chosen to join us for Lenten Wednesday evening worship. In times like this, we are all trying to find our way forward, but we know God still listens and is present to us. And it is good that we are together in any way we can be to worship and to pray. We also want to extend a, an a special word, a, a special word of gratitude to our Lenten speakers, all of whom agreed to send us recorded versions of the sermons they were going to deliver so we can continue with our series, discovering how we can be people of faith in a public and political environment and how to live as God's people in this time. So tonight we are honored to welcome the Reverend Jenny Mason, who is the Executive Director of St. Andrew's Community Resource Center, who has submitted a sermon for our, uh, our edification, enjoyment, consumption tonight. We're so grateful to be blessed by her. So I invite you now to prepare to worship as we join in the litany that will appear on your screen. When the whole world feels like a Lenten pause... We come tonight to be reminded that we are still God's, God's church, God's people, God's beloved. Like the green shoots stirring beneath the soil, we, we hunger, hunger for, for the, the stirring, stirring of God's, God's word in, in our, our lives. In this time of reflection and listening, we, we affirm our identity as God's, God's agents on earth. We come to be reminded of who is our neighbor and how, how to, to be, be a, neighbor. a neighbor. Let's sing. Let us pray together. O Lord, our God, in a world unsettled by fear and suspicion, teach us, your children, that love is the only means to conquer fear, the love we give and the love we receive. O Lord Jesus Christ, in a world full of anger and frustration, teach us, your siblings, that even now the hungry and homeless cry out for your justice. Equip us to feed the one who knocks on our door, you in the guise of the stranger. O Lord, Holy Spirit, Mother of Wisdom, teach us your children to, to care, care for, for one, one another, to protect one another, as you gather the, the nations under the feathers of your wings, 
help us to know your abundant peace. Amen. Amen. Hi, and thanks for the invitation to speak to you this evening at your midweek worship at Trinity Stillwater. My name is Jenny Mason. I'm the executive director of St. Andrew's Community Resource Center, and I've had the opportunity to meet um, some of you at a homelessness forum that we did earlier this year, and especially at the emergency winter shelter. Um, we'll talk a lot about that um, as we talk about who our neighbors are. Uh, tonight, but um, I want to say it was a great experience for me, and we are so grateful to be in partnership in the gospel with you. This Lenten series about who our neighbors are and campaigning really for our neighbors is a really important question for us in these times more especially now with the COVID virus that we're all facing as we do more things from our home and seek to protect others uh, by staying inside ourselves. Um, Jesus gave a masterclass on who our neighbor is, and I'm sure that you all know who, which passage I'm talking about. Um, the, the, the passage of the Good Samaritan really commences with a lawyer who um, comes to Jesus with his question about what he must do to earn eternal life. And Jesus, as a great teacher, gives it right back to him and says, what do you know from the law? And the lawyer responds beautifully. He says, uh, we are called to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our strength, with all our soul, and with all our mind and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And of course, Jesus says, you've answered well, uh, you've done a great job. Now go this and you will live. But the lawyer, as perhaps um, their training instructs them to do, has a follow-up question. And that follow-up question is um, perhaps one of the most uh, famous ones in the Bible. Who is my neighbor. Um, theologian Frederick Beekner says that since he was a lawyer, presumably he was looking for something on the order of this kind of response. A neighbor, here and after referred, referred to as the party of the first part, is to be construed as meaning a person of Jewish descent whose legal residence is within a radius of no more than three statute miles from one's own legal residence, unless there is another person of Jewish descent, here and after to be referred to as the party of the second part, living closer to the party of the first part than one is oneself, in which case the party of the second part is to be construed as neighbor to the party of the first part, and one oneself is relieved of all responsibility of any sort or kind whatsoever. But that's not the answer that the lawyer got. Instead, he got the story of the Good Samaritan. The point of which is that your neighbor is anyone that needs you. Wow, that can be really overwhelming. Um, but frankly, you all took that on as you took on emergency winter shelter uh, this winter. and. And many of you met your neighbors um, in the thank you letter to the volunteers that went out from John and Jeff and Roger. I heard that you met a mother and a small child seeking a warm space and lunch. You met a family's father who previously had avoided entering any building that provided services. You met folks that spent the previous night sleeping outside and you met guests who wanted a meal and someone to talk to, or perhaps better said, someone who might listen to them. This was really great work of serving neighbor. For if we are to love our neighbor before doing anything else, we must see our neighbors. Um, that might seem like a very simple thing, but if you've ever heard the phrase toxic charity, 
um, that speaks of that kind of charity that just assumes that it knows what our neighbor needs and then goes on and does it without really knowing our neighbor, knowing what would truly serve them best. You know what happens then when we think we see, but we don't really see. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, another theologian that I greatly admire, talks about needing to see not just our neighbor's faces, but to see the life behind and within their faces. That is to say, our neighbors must go from being an abstract concept to being real flesh and blood humans with stories and complexities and joys and sadnesses and the same things that each of us has. We are to see them as siblings made in the beloved image of God as we are and endued, endowed with our Creator's goodness. So if you sat down to share a meal with a neighbor during the daytime warming space uh, at your church in February and early March, that's what you did. And perhaps you heard firsthand the story of that one who fell into the hands of robbers and was stripped and beaten and left half dead in the road. Or maybe it was the story of, of the woman who works at Kohl's and uh, has been living in her car for the last eight months, but has license revocation fees that make it impossible for her to drive that car um, and fees that are so high for her that she feels um, she can't do that by herself. Or perhaps you heard <clears throat> the father who um, had never before come into that space and um, has always been a proud provider for his family. But after the accident that he had in his job, he couldn't do the same kind of labor. And then since that time, he has always, always been behind on rent. Um, we hear often from people uh, whom we help um, gratitude that now they can breathe just a little bit. And as we think about our breath, uh, we know that it is hard um, to, to breathe freely when we have stresses in our lives, when there are things <clears throat> weighting us down. So what we do by tending to neighbor is allowing some space for that sacred breath between us. I'd like to say a couple of things about who our neighbors are that we see in our work at St. Andrew's Community Resource Center. Um, and hopefully that you can um, begin to be more attentive to, um, that you might recognize them as you go about your own business. So two kinds of neighbors. One are those who come into our shelter and the other are the children um, in our schools. So 83% of those who come to us for shelter are single parents. Now, most of those are single moms, but we do have some wonderful single dads that have taken on the primary responsibility for raising their children. And so to be single uh, in, in this society, um, in this country, and more especially in Washington County, means that it's nearly impossible to keep a roof over your head. First, it's the wage that most of our folks would be paid, um, approximately $12 an hour when renting an apartment is approximately $22 an hour. So the math doesn't work. But then there's the irregular hours that you might work, the um, problems with health care and perhaps the lack of sick leave, uh, the other debts that you're trying to pay off. Um, and it becomes very, very challenging um, to make that rent payment each month. Um, these folks are the workers uh, at those annoying call centers. They're the clerks at the grocery store. They're the cook preparing your takeout order. Um, they, are, um, they are folks that we come into contact with 
uh, in the course of our everyday lives, working and perhaps also in shelter. Um, and then I also want to talk to you about um, our young people. Um, in our schools, there is a, um, a quali not a qualification, but it's a, uh, a capacity for those who are homeless and highly mobile to be um, tended to um, by legislation that's, that's called the McKinney-Vento Law. This is federal legislation that was first passed uh, in the late 1980s. Uh, Bruce Vento um, from Minnesota was um, one of the legislators who, um, for whom that legislation is named. And the McKinney-Vento Law helps uh, children who become homeless or have to move several times during the school year because of the instability of their family's housing it provides for those children to stay in their school district through the end of the year. Um, and the school district provides that transportation and then is reimbursed through federal funds. So each school district has a homeless liaison um, that uh, for whom their responsibility is to tend to those children and make sure they stay in school. Many of these liaisons do not have any um, uh, allocation of time in their jobs to do that. Um, so uh, we have felt like they are a group of heroes that need some special attention and every other month uh, we gather with the six um, homeless liaisons from the school districts that we serve uh, and we, we feed them, we love them up and we take some time um, first just to talk about where those numbers are going um, as the year progresses and um, what things they might need and they resource one another in that time. Um, the last time we met, which was the 1st of February, that number of homeless and highly mobile in the six school districts that we serve, all those school districts that are in Washington County or touch Washington County was 774. 774. And I can tell you that by this time in the year, that number is uh, at least 850 um, and tomorrow I intend to send out an email to those liaisons and, and ask them so at some point I'll let um, one of your pastors know and they can share that with you but for me this is incredible to think that in in the wealthy part of um, the East Metro in which we all live that there are nearly a thousand children every year whose families are either homeless or having to move around um, every few days, few weeks uh, because of housing instability. It's hard for those children to do well in school. Uh, it's hard for those children to complete their grade. It's, it's hard for those children to, um, uh, to develop that, that understanding of themselves as a, a loved and cherished child of God. Um, so we lift up the work of those homeless liaisons in our area. Uh, many more low-income persons live in the suburbs now. This is something that's changed in the last 15 years. Um, there's a statistic that has uh, really moved me and it says that 52% of the low-income uh, persons live in the suburbs now rather than the urban areas and 54% of the metro's low-income children live here in the suburbs. Um, it's driven by many factors. Uh, you know, the, the suburbs have changed over the years. Many more people are moving out here, but also jobs have come out this way. Um, housing in the city has become more expensive, so sometimes people can find um, naturally occurring affordable housing out here, older housing stock and that sort of thing. And so more people um, in poverty live here. And, and as I like to say, um, families love the life in the suburbs. They love the um, and value the, the education that their children get and this is where they they want to be and they want to stay. Um, so our neighbors in poverty 
are here and and it's up to us uh, to see them to notice them to love them and to serve them um, so as we think about who our neighbors are I think it begins with this it begins with seeing it begins with attempting a conversation it begins with um, recognizing Jesus in the other and with that thought I'd like to close with this prayer from Saint Teresa of Avila and she prayed every night let nothing O Lord disturb the silence of this night let nothing make me afraid let me wake refreshed ready to love and care for my neighbor as you have loved and cared for me and indeed as I love and care for myself for if I do not love others I cannot fool myself into believing that I love you I am I know as this day ends very far from such a love but hear my prayer when I see others let me see you let me show them the same reverence and respect that I would show you if I love them I will love you and I will want for nothing people of Trinity people of God you met your neighbor and responded to their need and connections were made I pray that you will continue to nurture those connections continue to see your neighbor to be neighbor uh, and pay attention to the gaps in our community as we understand community both near and far um, our neighbors are our fellow siblings in Christ waiting on us to love God with heart soul strength and mind and to love our neighbor as ourselves amen Lifting our prayers together with all the faithful around the world, we gather our prayers together and pray for the church, the world, and all those who are in need this day. O oh Lord our God, as many of us huddle at home or attend to responsibilities in different capacities, we are wrestling with questions and fears and uncertainties. We are looking for assurance. We are hoping against hope. We are seeking strength. We are hungry, and our neighbors are hungry. God, we pray for warm sunshine, for stability for families, for healed bodies, for rest from tears. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy One, your word reminds us that you do comfort us in tough times. And we ask today for you to fill us. Fill us with the breath of life, for relief from anxiety. Fill us with thankful and thoughtful hearts. Fill us with calmness, with courage, and with the knowledge of your presence. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We look to you, O oh God, to be present in our communities and in our world. Continue to show us how we are connected to each other, to our neighbors, and to be healers as the body of Christ. We pray for all those who are especially in need right now, for folks who are experiencing homelessness. Continue to call us to be your church that is not a building, but is part of your creative and renewing and sheltering work in the world. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Healing God, there are so many that we know and we love who are ill right now, and we ask that you surround them with your strong healing embrace. Be with all those who are caring for the sick, protect them, and use their many gifts to shelter the most vulnerable. God, we lift up to you all those who are on our hearts this day.
चार Most of all, O Lord, our God, continue to remind us of your deep love during these long days. You see us, you know us, and you care for each one of us. God, we lift all of these prayers to you, both spoken and unspoken, knowing that you gather together the whole great creation into your loving embrace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and all God's people said, Amen. As you find both comfort and community tonight, wherever you are, we send you with this blessing. Siblings in Christ, go forth in hope, trusting that we are empowered to serve together in faith, hope, and love. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.